Welcome to the Mindfulness Podcast. This is Dr. David Black. My guest today is Dr. Willem Koiken, Professor of Medical Sciences at the University of Oxford and a research clinical psychologist. He is director of the Oxford Mindfulness Center. He researches interventions aimed at treating depression, specifically mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, also known as MBCT. He has published this work in top medical journals, including the Lancet and the Journal of the American Medical Association. He is a fellow of the Academy of Cognitive Therapy. He co-authored a book in 2019 titled Mindfulness, Ancient Wisdom Meets Modern Psychology. Welcome, Dr. Koiken. It's great to have you. You're an expert in the area of depression. You conduct amazing trials in this area of work. Uh, what is depression? <laughs> it's probably good we start there. Like, we don't have to go too deep, but what, when you conceptualize depression, what is it? Because we, we're trying to intervene on it. Mm -hmm. And then why is cognitive behavioral therapy probably the thing, you know, the originating gold standard program, the thing for it? Maybe we'll start there. Yeah, so depression is something that I think is, if you look through history, if you look through literature, it's a kind of condition that's been around, you know, as far as the human condition goes back. And there are even evolutionary accounts of why um, human beings might suffer from depression. It was called melancholia. Um, it's been called a whole range of different things over the years, but it's essentially a pretty profound um, change in someone's ability to experience pleasure, experience, ability to um, uh, feel a sense of happiness. Um, and the, 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 the diagnostic criteria say it's something that has to have been around for at least two weeks, most of the day, nearly every day, in terms of like somebody feeling like totally flat, totally low, and then there need to be a number of other symptoms as well, at least five other symptoms in terms of things like um, not feeling good about yourself, um, suicidal thoughts, um, thoughts of guilt, indecisiveness, cognitive dysfunction, these kinds of things. What's very interesting about depression, to come to your other question about psychological approaches, I think it's long been observed that depression is something that is to do also with our behavior and how we think. And probably in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, the late Aaron uh, Tim Beck was somebody who was absolutely key in this area and observing that it was a particular constellation of thinking negatively about the self, about other people, about the world, uh, a way of thinking that can quite easily be tripped into by people with depression that characterizes major depressive disorder. And so he thought, well, if I can help people to recognize that thinking and to challenge and redress that thinking, I can help people with major depression. And that turned out to be the case. Numerous randomized trials now have suggested that cognitive behavioral therapy for depression is an effective way of treating depression. It's amazing, really, that a psychological approach can help people to recognize a psychological driver that maintains depression, if you like, and begin to shift and to change it. And you have experience there, because uh, reading on your bio uh, profile, you did work at the, was it correct, the Beck Institute to uh, get training in CBT? So you, you kind of know both ends of this, the clinical psychology piece and the research piece. Yeah, so I spent two years working with uh, Tim Beck as his postdoc, and it was two of the most extraordinary years in Philadelphia. He just recently passed away at the age of 100, and um, he was on the Nobel Prize list, um, shortlist, for quite a few years. And I think he is totally deserving of a Nobel Prize, that hundreds of millions of people have benefited from his work, not just with depression, but many, many mental health problems. And he was an extraordinary mentor. In fact, he wrote to me just last year and he said, um, Dear Willem, as I approach 100, I'm ever more keen to hear the latest news of your work. Please keep me up to date. So he was also, you know, a mentor in terms of this sort of incredible intellectual curiosity, um, rigorous empiricism, and, you know, a great mentor to a great many people as well, I think. So you, you're familiar with that program. And then so this extension, getting into your work in MBCT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, what was the originating factor there for you? Because you saw where the field was for decades, its utility, 
and then a transformation and why you and that transformation and why did you find that important? Wow, great question. And I think, oh, I could, I could, I could talk for a long time about that. I think probably the heart of it is that there's no doubt that CBT is an effective treatment for depression. But for many people with a history of depression, even if they can recognize their negative thoughts, even if they know it's irrational, they'll still say, I feel it in my guts. I, I still feel unlovable or unworthy in my guts. And I know it's irrational. And I know that the evidence doesn't stack up and that people do love me and I, there's lots of evidence of my worth. But at some kind of in, you know, body level, more experiential level, I've got this experience. And what I think the genius of uh, John Teasdale and Zindel Siegel and Mark Williams was, was to say, can we take cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based approaches and weave them together to help people to recognize and change their relationship to those thoughts. So it's not necessarily about logically seeing them and countering them and drawing up a whole list of evidence. Um, the metaphor I really like is actually from Winston Churchill who suffered from depression. And Winston Churchill used to communicate with his wife but also with himself by using the metaphor of a black dog. He would say the black dog is, is visiting. And what that meant was he was currently in an episode of depression or, or in the, you know, the prodrome of depression. And that was about not trying to fight the black dog, not trying to negate it, not trying to counter it, but kind of acknowledging it. And Matthew Johnston, who I think is one of the most um, skillful um, communicators of what depression is in his book I Had a Black Dog uses a series of illustrations whereby somebody changes their relationship to the black dog they befriend the black dog the black dog becomes a part of their life not something that is bigger than them that overwhelms them but in a way is a part of their life that they have a relationship to and with but they can stand back from and decenter from and I think that's something that mindfulness is very very good at um, doing um, I think there's something else about mindfulness which I personally think is one of the areas that we're going to see in the next 5, 10, 20 years, which is that working with depression is not just about working with um, the negative, negative thoughts, avoidant behaviours, because that takes people, as one patient put it to me, from the darkness to the grey. But we also need to help people move from the grey into the light. And in psychological language, I guess that's the positive valence system, the hedonic system, the reward and um, pleasure system, the kind of sense of living a life that's aligned with our values. And mindfulness can help with that. It can help people to open them up to a sense of appreciation of things that they enjoy, things that nourish them, things that soothe them, help them become more in tune with their values and begin to um, find their way through their lives perhaps I'm going to use the word maybe with a bit of more wisdom <laughs> in a way that's a bit more aligned with their values if you like yeah I think those are excellent two two excellent ways of looking at it uh, and I do imagine for people hearing and maybe in treatment right now um, that positivity part being a huge challenge because it's like well it's hard enough to get out of bed I you know where's the me that can do that so it makes me wonder about giving people a, a realistic expectation about time frame. And so what do you think about time? Or someone right now is in treatment, they're they're trying to find what you're talking about, this greater light in their life. What's the working through these things? Are we talking about weeks, months, years? Where where's the transitioning just to give realistic expectations? It's complicated. I would just start with a couple of epidemiological facts and say about 250 million people in the world today are suffering from depression. 
And at some point in their lives, about a billion people in the world today will suffer from depression. That most of the depression that we see in health and mental health services has tripped into a relapsing recurrent course. So people having more than one episode, they've had an onset in late adolescence, early adulthood, and then they maybe have another one in their 20s. And by then it's, it's rolling into a sort of relapsing course and residual symptoms never fully go away. So the first part of your question is, this is a big public health problem. The second part of your question is, it's a lifelong condition. And it has, um, I think, different needs when somebody is severely depressed, when somebody has residual symptoms, when somebody has never been depressed before, but they have um, the prodrome for depression. So I think different needs are needed at different points in that life course. But you're absolutely right, of course, just to come right back at where you asked that question. If somebody is currently depressed, they're not going to be wanting to think about what would my life look like if, if it was lived entirely aligned with my values. And they, they want to because it's a very, very aversive state. They want to be less depressed. And at times like that, antidepressants, behavioral activation, CBT will help them. As they start to come out of depression, and maybe they're on a maintenance dose of antidepressants, they're going to start saying, okay, these, is, these work, um, but I'm not sure I want to stay on antidepressants for the rest of my life. You know, they, for a start, the minute I stop taking them, their effects go away. And secondly, they have some side effects. There's maybe some blunting of emotion. For a lot of people, there can be um, changes in their um, sex drive and their ability to enjoy a sexual relationship. And if somebody's in, a, in a, an in intimate relationship, that's a, that can be a really important to them. So they want to have some alternatives. And I think at that point, preventative approaches like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, MBCT, can be really helpful. And then people say, OK, I'm now living my life in a bit more balance. But it still feels like the black dog is kind of a bit overwhelming and my life feels sort of out of sync. And I think there's something really interesting about depression that not always, but it can be a sort of um, pointer to people. And I actually think this is probably quite a big issue in the contemporary world. That is a pointer that people maybe aren't in a job that is the right job for them, a good fit for them. They aren't in a relationship that's a good fit for them. They aren't spending their waking hours in a way that actually nourishes them, that is aligned with their values. And at that point, they may be open to doing that work. So I don't think it's about throwing the kitchen sink at somebody with depression. At a, it's a really thoughtful, I think, approach to um, primary prevention, indicated prevention, um, secondary prevention, treatment, and long-term recovery. Yeah, I think in your example, made that very clear that it's the time orientation and the treatments offered during those times is how you approach it. And you, you made that very clear. Um, so you, you wrote a paper in 2010, how does mindfulness-based cognitive therapy work? And I think you're touching at some of those pieces. Uh, can we get the short version of that? Because I'm sure you went into a lot of detail, uh, but since you attended to that question... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know it's been a while. <laughs> what, what do you think are the well, take homes that, for that, that program? That, that paper in 2010, yeah. right? So that was yeah. 12, <laughs> 12, 12 years ago. It goes by in a flash. Feels like yesterday. Yeah, it does. <laughs> that paper was um, essentially using a self report measure and an experimental induction of low mood and cognitive reactivity. And it suggested that it's learning self-compassion that is key for people with recurrent depression. That is the skill that they learn that helps them to stay well. Stay well. That's what that paper back then suggested. So um, I might have an example here and I am being cued into something. You keep saying the black dog example, yeah. black lab example, and it's almost too pertinent to my life right now because uh, we had a sad case of, you know, dog we had for 10 years, we just had to put down a few days ago. I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. It was very tragic for my wife. It was uh, cancer of the spleen. Mm -hmm. And so that happens quick. And you never know the day they're going to be gone. The day he came and he showed us it was time and it's very tragic moments. 
And um, the recovery from that, what I, I was really watching my mind, luckily I've had a lot of experience in mindfulness training and practices, watching what it was trying to do. And it was attached to so many patterns of where is he? Where, like I found my eyes looking and detecting certain time of days, like where, why isn't he outside? My mind was searching for something that had been turned into the void and it yeah. couldn't make sense of it. It just couldn't. Mm-hmm. But I kept watching that, realizing, whoa, this could turn into a dangerous thing. I can imagine if this were much more severe. And I've had greater loss. And so I've seen this in various ways. But it's amazing how the mind is just reaching to like find that thing that's going to give it the dose of relief. And watching that for 24 hours, I think my my wife is, she's never lost a dog before. So she's still struggling much more than I am. But then I was listening to a a Ram Dass talk about anxiety and falling into the void. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it elicited, I like woke up in the middle of the night with this realization, which, and I think it, I'm going to speak to your point just here in a minute. It was watching what happened because we were creating a tragedy story out of those couple hours at the end, which Mm -hmm. it it was honestly a tragedy story to like not know exactly what to do. But then I took the bird's eye view. And I think this is what Ram Dass was saying in one of his talks what is the compassion that's happening in that moment? If you can get yourself out of there and look at the piece of you that wasn't tragic in that moment. And then all I saw was like people giving, if I could step back everything they could to a living being in the moment. And then it gave me so much relief. It's like, Oh, this isn't about me and the tragedy. I mean, we were doing everything here. Look how much love is, is in that moment. So I think in that story, I'm, I'm relating to what you said, because these, if you can find that part of you over time and in treatment, and I know I'm making a very small point of a much bigger issue for folks. So I don't want to downplay the importance here. Um, but that moment of seeing the broader you, and it's not a old tragedy, right? Is that linked to kind of the self-compassion element to, to see the greater effort at work, the greater wholeness at work, instead of seeing the smaller you that for some reason can't do things. Cause I think we were doing lovely things. I just couldn't see it in those moments. Cause I had built a tragedy story around it. Well, first of all, David, thank you for sharing that story. And I'm sorry for your loss. And I think what you've described is, is what is happening in NBCT in a nutshell. You know, what you described was the loss the mind just wanted to lock in with, I think the story, the story you called was a tragedy story. And that's what happens with recurrent depression is, uh, you know, uh, people make sense of losses and sometimes they're not even real losses. They can be, you know, mental events, like the momentary, a momentary sadness that comes out of nowhere. And they will create in that moment a locked in, to use your language, tragedy story of why me? Oh no, here I go again. And what you've described is the nub of it. You, you talked about a bird's eye view, about standing back, about seeing this as part of common humanity. Loss of every shape, size and form is part of life and of being able to create a different story, a shifted perspective. And that's the nub of it. That's absolutely the nub of it, from the small to the big. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much. And hearing it from other folks, too, and this is probably part of the group-based work, it's like hearing that story reflected, it's like, oh, yeah, uh, you could see it as tragedy. And I imagine, you know, being in various mindfulness-based courses, you hear it from other folks and you're like, oh, yeah, they're, they weren't a victim in that story. They were actually doing the best they could in that story. Um, that story wasn't so much of tragedy. It was of courage and overcoming something that was seemingly impossible. Like, how would any of us know how to deal with end of life? We can't, right? Um, so giving that room for compassion, like, you know, you can't fix everything. You can't accomplish everything in perfect sequence. And I wonder, does that link up to some depressive symptoms about people thinking they can analyze this thing and figure it all out. And that's not the point, right? Yep. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the hub of it, isn't it? As people lock into and, and trip down into depression, that ruminative, proliferative and um, narrowed mindscape is exactly what depressive relapse psychologically looks like for many people. I want to just knit together two things, um, if I may. Um, one is what we what you were just saying about what was the name of your dog if you don't mind me asking Huxley after Aldous Huxley <laughs> so the way you in the last little while have related to the loss of Huxley and um, the way you stepped back shifted your perspective and were able to see different stories and different narratives emerging and the common humanity of loss the knitting together I want to do is is that in a way what we're teaching people in MBCT is the ability to see the workings of the mind, to see how in any moment it can actually narrow and contract and constrain and, and trip into rumination. And we can see that and step back from it, take a bird's eye view and do something differently. The bit I wanted to knit together is the bit with the positive valence system, because this is not a mental architecture that is restricted to moments of challenge or difficulty. The same mental architecture applies to all of our lives. So there will have been moments with Huxley throughout his life, which would have been moments of joy, moments of connection, moments of love, moments of playfulness. The same thing can happen there. Can we step back, see the common humanity of moments of connection, um, to see the pleasure and the, the love that exists in moments of relationship? I remember for somebody in an NBCT program towards the end, she just described the moment where she went to the airport. This was a woman with grown up children and she was waiting at the airport for her um, daughter to come through the arrivals hall. And I love waiting in arrivals halls. It's just a very interesting place. The moments where people are reunited with friends and family that they've not seen from, they're just such beautiful moments. And that same mental architecture applies to those moments too. And if people can see that and work with those moments too, that's the time I think in which moments of appreciation, moments of joy, the potential for savoring, the potential for flourishing, and in psychological language, the kind of pleasure system, the motivational system, um, all of that can come into play. Yeah, and it's, so if I flip the coin also, because it was something I was working with, because uh, we had about a two-week prognosis that we were offered of, of life there, and I also realized the attachment I was having for those things you just said, which yeah. is also another form of suffering, right? I was, I was trying to capture the moment. I was like, use my eyes to absorb all, attend to all elements. And I was like, you're going to exhaust yourself here. <laughs> you're trying to, you're trying to live a thousand lives with this dog uh, for two weeks. And you're also going to add, I realized, I didn't realize it at the time because it felt so good to want to be there and embrace and do all those things. But at the end, I was like, you also won't remember that. Yes. And because the memory is tricky. And my wife and I have been having this conversation, how tricky memory is. It's like, yeah. we're going to remember, let's force ourselves to remember all of this, all yeah. the beauty. And then a week later, I can't remember, wait, where did he used to sit? And it's the tragedy. It's also letting go of that. It's, oh, I have to let go of the limitations of my own desires to remember everything and uh, so I can also you imagine were trying to, you were trying to bank the present for the future. Yes, 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 yes. I was, but you definitely. know that it yeah. really I, I love that story. That's, a, you know, it's a really beautiful illustration. So in a way, I think what you're saying, if I've understood you correctly, is that instead of being fully present with him for those last two weeks, you were in a way almost trying to strive to hang on to some of the positive moments to save them into the future. Yes, yes, exactly. There's a, there's a painful example. Um, illustrative example I have of a woman who was in one of my classes and one of the things you do in MBCT is a, um, a way of helping people to begin to become good at spotting the way the mind does this both with pleasant and unpleasant moments and um, she was recording a pleasant moment for the week as part of her home practice her homework and she was pushing her kid on the swings 
and um, he was chortling. I mean, he was really happy. And she thought, oh, this is, a this is a good moment. I can write this on my journal and take it back to the NBC class next week. But she was a woman with a long history of depression. So guess what the next thought was that came to her mind? This moment, it's not going to last. Good moments never last for me. And that just spiraled really quickly for her into, I'm not a good mother. Um, and I need to get home. And I don't know that I can cope with looking after my son for the whole of the It just spiraled really quickly. And she came back and she told that story to the class. And the whole class, well, yeah, we do that too. We can even take positive moments and we can somehow attach a secondary meaning to them that turns them into negative moments. And she said this phrase, which I'll never forget, and everybody in the class went, ah, oh, yes. She described them as wrecking ball thoughts. You know those old fashioned big balls they used to swing on a chain to knock buildings over? They were like wrecking ball thoughts. They would just come in and destroy a moment. And I think that's the work of MBCT is to begin to see that process, to see those wrecking ball thoughts. And what I loved about that metaphor, which I think she shared with the class the next week was the beauty of a wrecking ball is you can step back and let it go swinging straight past you. You don't have to get knocked over by it. And it will eventually, if you don't engage with it, it will eventually lose its power. It will swing back and forth and eventually it'll stay still. And I just thought it was such a powerful metaphor and um, people talked about that right the way through to the end of that particular class yeah i agree and it's the the metaphor is one of such predictability right we yep. know what it wants to do yep like what is that self what is that about us that we can let go of that because we know where that wants to go yes <laughs> and it's exactly too easy right. to follow it you exactly. can jump on a wrecking ball. And I think some famous uh, stars have done videos <laughs> in this way, music videos. But yeah, once you're on it, you're just swinging along the same path anyway. <laughs> I think you kind of know that. <laughs> so yeah, I, that's that's a beautiful example. Um, and I'm feel I'm trying to, in my realization of the brevity of time and how the mind tries to grasp and hold on to so many patterns and not forget them. I notice myself now being sensitive to doing this with my sons and I'm, I'm like, Oh, you don't, you don't need to do that same thing because if, if you now can collapse time, you know, you have this big amount of time with your kids now. And yeah. I'm, what my mind is doing is, is a fear element, which is, Oh, it just means bigger time, but the same thing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It can all collapse mm -hmm. in that same way. And are you yeah. going to remember the small foot? <laughs> that's sitting on the side of the bed. And then I noticed myself, I'll like, say, oh, you've been like tied into this whole sequence now mm -hmm. of patterns mm -hmm. of being overly reactive to mm -hmm. any cue you're getting in your environment that has sentimental uh, attachment for you. And then just seeing it and being like, oh, it's a beautiful foot. That's a nice thing. Yeah. Taking a breath and moving on to the next moment. Because you do see that wrecking ball. It can't, and especially yeah. in moments, I think I'm just especially vulnerable right now. And maybe there's beauty in that. And I'm also accepting that I'm not trying to resist what's happening, uh, but noticing and being like, Oh, I see my mind right now in my life wants to hold on to just about anything. Cause it's, yeah. it's like slightly broken in a way at this point. Um, but you know, over time and reminding myself not to just grab on to these things, like the, just stay with the fullness is, is where the beauty is. So. I know you've had, um, John Kabat-Zinn on this podcast as well. And of course, you'll know that he and his wife, Myla, um, wrote their book about mindful parenting. And they talk about what you've just spoken about, that parenting is an incredible opportunity to practice mindfulness, you know, recognizing patterns of mind, patterns of behavior, and using parenting as a practice. And in the way you've just described it, which is beautiful, is this idea of potentially intergenerational learning. You know, interrupting the own patterns that we know for ourselves to be problematic so that we support our children to 
not step into those same things, not create the same suffering in their own lives. And I think there are some data now, and um, people like Susan Bogles have done some really interesting work in this area, suggesting that um, mindfulness-based approaches for parents do have these effects. In fact, I had a PhD student, Joe Mann, who uh, developed a protocol, and we did a pilot study that showed really promising effects of parenting with um, uh, parents with a history of depression. Yeah, it re- that has been my most challenging practice. <laughs> the the toddler screaming and trying to identify how I'm going to be okay with this. <laughs> well, um, one of the things, I mean, and I'm not trying to speak about your parenting at all here, yeah. but one of the things we discovered, which we just taken from just good sound mindfulness teaching is that we start with the little things. And a toddler screaming in a supermarket is a pretty big thing, right, in the parenting domain. Um, so, you know, in, in the standard mindfulness based um, programs, they start with eating a raisin as a very, very benign, small practice of slowing things down, engaging with the senses and so on. So we started with parenting of going in and seeing your child asleep. And seeing if one can have a sense of awareness when the child is actually asleep. So there's no the chances of reactivity are much lower and then slowly a bit like the raisin slowly working up so i think you know um a toddler screaming is is basically is you know it's like a it's like a graduate class yeah (laughs) (laughs) it started too uh too early in that example so true so true uh so with um if we can go back to depression recurrence because this is a classic outcome that you've studied yeah um So usually using mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is a type of prevention program in a way. So maybe we'll take our minds to the place where there's been frontline treatment. The person has found relief. They're perhaps managing their symptoms. And what's that defining moment where it's kind of transitioning to, okay, now we're preventing relapse. And then what is, how do you bring in MBCT in that moment? So the way this started was um, when um, MBCD was first developed by John Teasdale, Zindel Siegel and Mark Williams. Um, MBCD was for people who had um, a history of depression and were currently well, i.e. asymptomatic. And they also wanted to maximize the chances of uh, relapse. So they made sure that everybody had come off their antidepressants relatively recently because they wanted to have a chance for MBCD to have an effect. Um, And so it started off being a treatment for people with a history of depression who are currently well. But what's happened since then, there's been at least 10 randomized controlled trials. It's now pretty clear that it also works for people with significant residual symptoms. You know, they can have maybe not full blown severe depression, but quite a lot of depressive symptomatology. And in fact, in our own um, meta-analysis, you know, amalgamation of data, and it was an individual patient data meta-analysis, so we had the the full data set, so we worked by amalgamating all 1,258 of the people in in the nine trials. We were able to show that actually it was the people with more depressive symptoms that did better with MBCT, and there have now been at least three trials suggesting that people with a history of trauma do better with MBCT than with the control conditions. What's that about? I think it's because people have got more grist for the mill. I don't know if that's an American expression, but they've got more to work with. There is more likelihood for the things we've been talking about, the kind of ruminative response styles, the reactivity to be a feature of their depression. The flip side of that, is folks who don't have that maybe don't need to do MBCT. I mean, that's the beauty of individualized, personalized medicine, is the beauty of research, is to say, is there maybe a more cost-effective and less intensive way for people to learn skills to stay well in the long term? And I think for people who don't have that profile, light psychoeducation may be all that they need. Um, or some exercise or something like that. I think the data is pointing in that direction. There have been a few more trials suggesting depression might be indicated actually for people who are currently depressed. My my own view is that that is preliminary, Um, but it's certainly something that can break up that pattern of relapsing depression. 
I think the next thing I would say, David, which may well be something you're about to ask about, is the role of antidepressants. Um, you know, throughout the world, antidepressants are the mainstay approach to treating depression. And of course, most clinical guidelines will say, stay on them for at least probably two years for somebody who's got a, you know, a fairly serious history of depression. That's a long time. And what we've just demonstrated in our work is um, in, in two IPDs now, is that um, MBCT and CBT can provide alternatives to staying on antidepressants. That if people um, learn the skills of cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, they can consider tapering and coming off their medication. And I'm not saying that in a kind of all or nothing kind of way. I think that needs to be measured. It needs to be thoughtful. People need to feel that they are genuinely equipped to do that. They need to do it in a way that is slow and gradual. Um, but that's an extraordinary breakthrough, I think, because that gives begins to give people choices, right? It gives people the choices to come off their meds, to taper their meds. And that doesn't mean it has to be for life. It may, maybe two years from then, they have another big flurry of symptoms. And they want to go back on their meds again. But at least they've got the recognition, they've got the armory, and they've got that sense of self-efficacy um, about ways to, to manage depression or, or whatever metaphor they use, they, the use of it, black dog or whatever it might be. And so this relates to your work uh, that you published in The Lancet in 2015, a top medical journal, uh, you did a superiority trial. So you're trying to identify if, you know, having something like MBCT would be statistically superior. And it links because, you know, if you're, whenever we get stuck at the group level of analysis, you can find an implication as you did in that study, like it may not be superior, but it definitely is an alternative because also the drug itself didn't prove better right so for people who don't understand the trial dynamics like what what do you think you found there and what's the interpretation well, there are there are quite a few issues in here and um this is a bit geeky maybe but i think it's really important we can geek uh, out for a minute <laughs> yeah yeah so you know we you know when you do a big trial you spend a lot of money and a lot of time doing a big trial you've normally done quite a lot of groundwork before so we published actually in 2008 a pilot study suggesting that MBCT could be better than maintenance antidepressants. But it was a pilot study, and it was the basis for the trial that you've just described in the Lancet. The pilot study had 123 people, two conditions, MBCT or, or uh, antidepressants and coming off your antidepressants. Um, sorry, let me rephrase that. So the, the, the design of both trials, the pilot and the main trial, was... Um, People were on antidepressants and they either in the control condition stayed on their antidepressants throughout the trial or in the experimental condition, the MBCT condition, they learned the skills in MBCT and then tapered and discontinued their meds. Now, we powered the big trial on superiority. The hypothesis was that MBCT would outperform antidepressants. With big trials, And that's a big ask, right? That's, a, that, that's that, always a that big was, ask. That was a big ask, but... Hmm. Staying with the geeking out, um, superiority is a lot easier to demonstrate than equivalence or non-inferiority because of the numbers required. Um, to get a, a small or a medium effect size, or particularly a medium effect size in a superiority trial, is a lot easier than demonstrating that something is equivalence because of the confidence intervals around the two interventions. So then we the other thing you do with the trial is you make sure you're blind and you don't know what's going to happen. And the way I do my trials is we are blind right up until the point the whole trial team comes together. And then what we do is the statistician presents the results to the team with group A and group B. And we don't still know what group A and group B are. And we write the opening paragraph of the discussion together without knowing which condition is which. So we try to interpret the trial without knowing which condition is which. And of course, it was really clear that we had not set out what we demonstrated to do, and we wanted to report that transparently, but there appeared to be a signal. So that was interesting. And so we reported it transparently in the Lancet, but we thought we'll look at all the other trials together. We will do this meta-analysis with individual patient data. So our trial only had a 424 people in it, the, the Lancet trial. 
the IPD meta-analysis had four studies that compared um, MBCD with antidepressants. And that gave us much more power. And now here is another geeky thing, but it interacts with clinical significance, both from the patient point of view, but also from the clinician point of view, is the meta-analysis demonstrated statistically that MBCT outperformed antidepressants. But I talked quite a lot to my physician friends and the psychiatrist and the general practitioner, the family doctor on the team. And I deliberately did not want to present it that way because there was too much variation. I didn't want people to read the abstract of this paper online and go to their family doctor and say, can I come off my antidepressants? Because I thought that would be dangerous because there was too much variation in the interval. So for me, the statistical finding was not the same as the clinical implication. The statistical finding was that MBCT did better than antidepressants. To me, the clinical implication was we have presented a possible alternative for people that they need to think through carefully and talk through with their physician. So I think, sorry, that's me just geeking out on the science and the story of those, those studies together. Um, and yeah, I think if I can, it, so if I can add to that for folks mm-hmm. why we would geek out, and I love geeking out, but the, the thing we're getting at, everything that we just said for those not into talking shop <laughs> or wondering the outcome, this is just showing the poise and the challenge in doing trials and making very careful decision rules, because if you really want to get a trial to have bang for its buck, getting a clear interpretation, and you were being very cautious. So you talked about the methods like blinding, making decision rules when you were still blinded, which is rare, but is a good practice we should be using more and more, like see, get a third party to analyze the data, a priori decision rules, don't yep. touch anything, yep. make the interpretation. Yep. And it's clinical reason, how reasonable it is before you know these groups. So you don't like fall into, so why would that be a problem? Some people might be asking their unconscious and conscious bias that goes into once you know which group it is to want to be telling a story. And so you were, you're talking about all the ways in which you did good science, basically, in a nutshell. So that's why we were geeking out for a minute. Can I add one thing to that, David, which I think is really of the moment because we are, at some point in the arc of this COVID pandemic is the thing about science is science is relative. The state of knowledge we have at any given time is the state of knowledge at any given time, and it will generate more uncertainty. And that uncertainty is then the subject of future research. So I think it's really interesting that when we started seeing vaccines being developed, some of the vaccines were developed here in Oxford and I knew the teams wanted to get the vaccines out fast. So what they did is they worked with highly vulnerable groups, groups in which it was really likely that the vaccine would be effective. And that meant that when those trials were published, people said, yeah, but you haven't demonstrated it works in this group. That's because they simply hadn't demonstrated it yet. They hadn't prioritized that because they wanted to get a vaccine out to as many people as possible, as fast as possible. It didn't actually take long. Six months later, they extended the trial to prioritize those groups, but they put all their resources into the highly at-risk groups first. And that's something about the provisional nature of knowledge. And I think where we are at the moment with how to treat depression is a provisional state of knowledge. hundred years from now, it's likely to look quite different when we know more about genetics, about diet, about the relationship between the mind and the body, about the importance of social relationships. I think Uh, And I feel very strongly about that, that it's not a weakness of science that there is uncertainty. It is one of the joys of science that there is uncertainty. Absolutely agreeing and agreeing. And uh, so you gave a a nice articulation about uh, the potential to taper for folks. I'm sure if we look at the case level, like at the person by person level, not the group level, some people might be excited by that, right? And can you just link it to maybe some uh, observations you make in your in your MBCT programs, or you might have people at the case level saying like, "Hey, this is great," or "I'm gonna, you know, under guidance, kind of taper." And I do realize I need to go back. Like, what are those conversations like where people are trying? You know, the the prescription medication you have to have a relationship with it in a way, right? Because it comes into your life. You recognize there are changes. You recognize the risk. You recognize there are things you don't like. 
then there you you know people may try to say okay i want to taper i'm not liking this right now what is that relationship like it's a complex relationship i love the way you use the word relationship because i think my own view about um, helping people with depression recover from depression is is you're helping them to develop a number of relationships one is their relationship with their own mind and we've already talked about that right the way in which the mind can be reactive and it can lock into negativity and we're trying to develop a different relationship with the mind i think we're then also developing a relationship with a whole raft of ways of taking care of ourselves you know a lot of people you know there's a fair number of people in that in the caring professions who are not great at taking care of themselves you know they will prioritize taking care of their family nurses who will prioritize their work health professionals teachers and so on and you're asking them to develop a relationship with their self-care actually it is a service to my students to my patients to my colleagues to go for a run every morning to meditate every morning to eat well i'm not being self-indulgent i'm actually providing a service to myself and the people i interact with and i think the relationship with medication is part of that in the same way the relationship with exercise or food is a part of that um that the medication serves me well at these points and that not at these points and to make this really concrete somebody might say you know um, i've heard that mbct can be really helpful and i'd like to do a class but i'm just going through a divorce and i'm moving house and um i've just moved to this new city i might well say this maybe is not the right time this class will be here six months from now 12 months from now get yourself settled, settled in the new city let the antidepressants see you through this period come back six months 12 months from now um that i think is bereavement is another example not an easy time to really be looking at your own mind coming off substances not a good time to be really looking at your own mind certainly in the mbct context the final thing i'd say about this issue of relationship david which i think is really interesting is i think people also start to develop a relationship with their mindfulness practice and i gone off the metaphor of seeing mindfulness a bit like physical exercise because so many people join the gym for new year and by february they're sitting on the couch feeling cross with themselves for having spent all that money but i i think it's a much better analogy is of seeing it like a best friend it's a relationship that we have we place value in that we get a lot out of and therefore we are willing to invest in so when people see their mindfulness practice as something that they are investing in that they they know will look after them in return they often will develop long term relationship with mindfulness practice not necessarily 45 minutes sitting doing yoga every day but a sense of a long term relationship that they're developing so i love that term david i think it's a really really good term to use about what we're supporting people to do as they recover from depression which is to develop these new relationships and is it, it with a program that not say in studies but if at your center and people are enrolling and coming at various versions of where they are and what relationships they have can they make decisions under guidance at those points to taper if they like uh, what's the guidance there are they working with psychiatrists what's what's the process of if someone's interested in like engaging more in MBCT and wanting to explore if that's an option for them mm-hmm. Well, I ran a I ran a clinic in my previous job over many years, and um, I started to develop a lot of relationships with the prescribing physicians. And I think they got it by the end of the time I was there; they got it. But of course, there's huge individual differences with prescribing physicians. I mean, some of them are pretty patriarchal and um, will have a very clear view about how things should be done. But I think more and more prescribing physicians see prescription of mental health um drugs like depression as a collaborative process you know the person is an expert in their own mind they're an expert in the the effects of these meds they're an expert in their um side effects they're an expert in the history of their own depression and i think when they can then collaborate with a prescribing physician who knows about the meds and about the clinical guidelines and so on i think that's the best model 
Um, and I think more and more physicians are moving in that direction. And I think knowledge is tremendously helpful for patients. I mean, not, you know, not a little knowledge, but good knowledge of their own mind and which medications have worked for them over the years and with, over which periods of time. Well said, well said. And the, maybe a final question here would be about the large scale implications. So your parliamentary government, from what I read, um, have made some recommendations. I don't fully understand it. This is kind of outside of my wheelhouse, but where's your understanding engagement been for how MBCT is part of healthcare delivery, perhaps based on your work and other, other people's work? So I believe that MBCT now is in the clinical guidelines for depression in numerous countries here in the UK, in North America, in Canada, in Japan, in many European countries, in Australia and New Zealand. So the clinical guidelines for depression in those countries recommend MBCT as an approach to preventing depression. I think that's tremendously helpful for people themselves looking online and then being able to go and try and access those treatments. In this country, it is now also part of the National Health Service. So we have a program here called Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. And that now includes the provision of MBCT for anybody who suffers from recurrent depression. So it is part of the state free provision. And I would say over 50% of services now have got trained MBCT teachers. So it's very much woven into the fabric. And in fact, we've done some research to suggest that the effect sizes we've seen in trials are replicated in those mainstream, mainstream services. So I think that's the next challenge. It's the implementation challenge. There's really no point doing all of this research if, you know, a friend of yours or a friend of mine or indeed us go and try and seek out something that we know that works and it's just not accessible or it's not delivered in a way that is high quality and has fidelity to the original intentions of the program. So that's the next challenge, the implementation challenge. And I think that's happening certainly in in many European countries, I believe it's happening in Canada and North America and in, in other countries around the world as well. So your work has uh, built a very significant bridge moving forward. There's so many things unknown, but you've done excellent work. And so where are you headed now? Where's your research program headed? So in two areas, um, one of which I won't say much about because I'm hoping that we will have another podcast to talk about this, which is taking this upstream to children and young people. But the other place it's headed is using the analogy of heart disease. So 50 years ago, most of the effort of heart disease was treating people with current heart disease. And then it went into indicated prevention. So could we identify people at risk for heart disease with hypertension, for example, and start thinking about offering treatments for those to more large scale interventions, which were about the whole population, like a public health approach, diet, exercise, and I think the same is happening with um, MBCT and mindfulness. We're going from treatment to um, pre indicated prevention to saying these are foundational skills of attention, of emotion regulation. You talked about um, Huxley and the everyday losses of everyday life. These are skills for that. They're not just skills for depression. And I think if we want to do the equivalent that we've seen with heart disease of diet and exercise, these are really basic changes that will, will massively shift the population of heart disease towards better heart health. We can do the same thing with psychology. We can teach foundational skills that can shift the bell curve towards greater mental health and well-being by making these foundational skills really accessible and really tractable. That sounds very promising for the future of humanity. Thank you, Dr. Quake. And let's conclude for today. Find our podcast recordings at goamra.org, G-O-A-M-R-A, where you can support us and become a member. That's it for today. Bye now.